Good morning. I want to welcome you to this service of worship at City Road Chapel, United Methodist. My name is Jay Voorhees. I'm the pastor here, and I want to welcome you and hope that you find the presence of the risen Christ in our service today. Uh, I do have just a couple of announcements uh, to get us started. Uh, for those who have been here for a while, um, you're going to look and say, when did those exit signs get put up? They got put up this week because our insurance company said you're going to put up exit signs. So in case you think it detracts from the way our sanctuary looks, sorry, our insurance company doesn't care. So, uh, so that's uh, what those are. Also, you'll notice that we've got an announcement now. We are, if, if you're around uh, during the dark hours and go out under the gym, you'll recognize that a whole bunch of lights have burned out under the gym. We're wanting to replace those with LED lights. Um, and so um, we are asking if anybody wants to adopt a light to make a donation to help pay for those, uh, we would like for you to do that. We're also finishing out replacing the lights in the gym with LEDs as well. So uh, there's an announcement about that. Um, with that, can I get you to close your eyes for a second? Were you there when he rose up from the grave? Were you there when he rose up from the grave? Oh, 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 oh. sometimes you know I feel like shouting, shouting, shouting. Were you there? When he rose up from the grave. If you'd like, you can follow along in your bulletin. John chapter 20, verses 1 through 9. Early in the morning of the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. She ran to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord from the tomb, and we don't know where they've put him. Peter and the other disciple left to go to the tomb. They were running together, but the other disciple ran faster than Peter and was the first to arrive at the tomb. Bending down... To take a look, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he didn't go in. Following him, Simon Peter entered the tomb and saw the linen cloths lying there. He also saw the face cloth that had been on Jesus' head. It wasn't with the other clothes, but was folded up in its own place. Then the other disciple, the one who arrived at the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They didn't yet understand the scripture that Jesus must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to the place where they were staying. Christ, Christ. is risen. Christ, Christ is, is risen, risen indeed. indeed. I invite you to stand as you're able as we sing, Christ the Lord is risen today.
living Christ. He lives. good news which we have received, in which we stand, and by which we are saved. Christ died for our sins, was buried, was raised on the third day, and appeared first to the women, then to Peter and the twelve, and then to many faithful witnesses. We believe that Jesus is the Christ, the anointed one of God, the firstborn of all creation, the firstborn from the dead, in whom all things hold together, in whom the fullness of God was pleased to dwell by the power of the Spirit. Christ is the head of the body, the church, and by the blood of the cross reconciles all things to God. be seated. We continue the story from John chapter 20. Mary stood outside near the tomb crying. 
As she cried, she bent down to look into the tomb. She saw two angels dressed in white, seated where the body of Jesus had been, one at her head, one at the head, and one at the foot. The angels asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken away my Lord, she said, and I don't know where they've put him. As soon as she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she didn't know it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you crying? Who are you looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she replied, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Don't hold on to me, for I haven't gone up to, be, to my father Go to my brothers and sisters and tell them, I'm going up to my father and your father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene left and announced to the disciples, I've seen the Lord. Then she told them what he had said to her. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. I believe in the sun I believe in the risen one I believe I've overcome By the power of his blood
Would you pray with me? Friday night, O oh Lord, you were hung on the cross and laid in the grave. And now we come, for you have triumphed over the power of sin and death. Help us to be transformed and renewed by the power of your Son, by the Spirit that speaks. God, move in our hearts and help us to hear your voice anew. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. This past Friday, we did leave this place in darkness. And Christ had died and we had nailed him to the cross. And so we exited in darkness, overwhelmed with a sense of loss at the death of the one who had been sent by God. And the Gospel of John also begins the Easter story in darkness. Early in the morning, while it was still dark, John says, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb because earlier in the week he'd been executed and in his death her hope had died also and so she went to visit with the body. Now, although her hopes had been dashed, it wasn't the only time that someone's hopes had been dashed. Everyone knows those moments of utter darkness. Earlier this week in a doctor's office here in Nashville, someone learned that the cancer had returned and there was little chance for survival and, and hope fluttered out the window. Earlier this week, a man heard the words, I don't love you anymore and I want a divorce and all his, all his hopes of fatherhood and success seemed empty. Earlier this week, parents were disappointed by children. Earlier this week, someone else's dreams were ripped away. Earlier this week, someone's hope was crucified and the resulting darkness is overwhelming. As Craig Barnes, the pastor of the National Presbyterian Church in Washington says, no one is ever really or prepared to encounter Easter until he or she has spent some time in a dark place where hope cannot be seen. Easter is the last thing we're expecting. And that's what terrifies us. Because this day is not about bunnies and springtime and cute girls and new dresses. It's about more hope than we can handle. More hope than we can handle. How do you get from no hope to more hope than you can handle? When hope is gone, why bother? Now, it's hard to know what Mary was thinking as she headed down the road toward that tomb. Uh, like many of us visiting the graves of those who've gone on before us, she probably needed to stand and, and look and listen as she tried to make sense of what had happened over the past few days. And surely as she traveled that day, memories of better times in Galilee would have flooded her mind. And how distant those memories must have seemed. I mean, Jesus was popular there. He had crowds pushing him on, around him on all sides. Everyone had great hope that he was the Messiah who would free them from their oppression. Now, he was his own man, for sure. No one ever quite knew what to expect from him. But nowhere in the hope that he gave them would they have considered that he was now destined for death on a cross as a rebel rouser and a blasphemer. And now the hope that they had had was gone, pierced by three spikes through human flesh. Remembering the shame of it all, Mary drew her cloak around herself for comfort. She was just numb. But when she arrived at the tomb, things were not in order. She had expected the tomb to be closed as any proper tomb should be, but instead it was, it was open. It was, it was wide open, and the stone was rolled away, and by all indications the tomb was empty. <clears throat> Grave robbers, she must have thought. My God, can this get any 
worse? So Mary did what any of us would have done in the days before cell phones. She ran back to Peter and some other unnamed disciple, we don't know who it is, and told them that something was wrong. The master is gone, she cried. They've taken him out of the tomb, and we don't know where he's been taken. Now, given that Peter and this other guy were guys, they did what men are prone to do. They had to run to the tomb to check things out on their own. And as guys are prone to do, these guys turned their running back into a competition, racing to see who would get there first, who would be the first to enter the tomb, yada, yada. You know how guys are. And they wandered about a bit, and they looked in the tomb and scratched their heads, and, and the unnamed disciple looked around and said, yeah, this tomb's empty. Yeah, he must be gone. And then, having proved to themselves that the tomb was indeed empty, they couldn't have taken her word for it, they had to see for themselves, they headed home without so much as a word to Mary. The good news is that that wasn't good enough for Mary. She had come expecting to find things in order, and they weren't. She had come trying to make sense of the death of a loved one, but now she was confused. She had come thinking that Jesus' body would be there when she arrived, but instead she found an empty tomb. And the thought of the possibilities drove her to tears. And it would have been easy to leave with the men. Honestly, there was little that she, as a woman, could have done but she couldn't leave. She just couldn't. It was, this was so awful that the Sabbath had gone from bad to worse. And so in the midst of her weeping and her hopelessness, she found herself bending down to see the black emptiness of the tomb again. Maybe the sad truth would sink in if she just had one more look. But of course, as we heard earlier, she was in for a shock. The tomb was not empty at all. She would have sworn earlier that there was nothing in the tomb but rags, but now two angels in white were sitting where Jesus' body should have been. They looked at her with compassion and asked why she wept. Why am I weeping, she said. They've taken my master from this grave, and I don't know where to find him. And she turned away from these men in white only to find another one standing before her. And unlike the angel, he was dressed in simple clothes. He, he must have been a gardener, she thought. Ma'am, why are you crying, he asked. Are you looking for someone? And Mary, she was just tired of everything. She, all these men asking questions at every turn. Look, she said, if you took him from here, please tell me where. I just need to see him, to, to take care of him. Please tell me where he is. Mary, the man said. And it was Jesus, alive. And in that moment, Mary's hope came back to life. Her expectations were rekindled. She was in the presence of the risen Christ. And to think if she'd gone home like the man, if she had gone home, if she hadn't hung around, if she hadn't been willing to take another look and stare in that gaping hole of death and stare at it in the face, she would have missed him. It took a second look, a second glance in the midst of her pain to hear Jesus call out her name and to see his face come into view. So why do we bother when hope seems gone? Because we believe in a God of second looks. We drift into a whirlpool of despair, a vortex of desolation, only to find that when we look at despair in the face, love breaks through because Christ has risen to call us by name. We bother because we know that there is so much more to the story that we can't head home until we see Jesus face to face. And then when we stand in his presence and hear him call out our name, we, like Mary, discover a hope that is more than we can handle. Amen. You see, it's not 
simply enough to know that the tomb was empty. Peter and the other disciple knew that the tomb was empty, and then they headed home for another glass of wine. They weren't changed by knowing that Jesus was missing. It didn't make much of a difference in their lives. It was just another mystery in, the, in a week full of mysteries. What's more important is that we encounter the risen Christ, that we stand in the garden and hear him say our name. For when we meet him and we hear him and we see him, we find our tears turning into laughter, our sorrows turning into dancing, our despair transformed into hope. As Mary discovered, standing in the presence of the risen Christ puts a whole new spin on the world. It provides a new way of thinking. Back in the 1980s, Ted Koppel was hosting Nightline, and he had Archbishop Desmond Tutu on the show. This was the time during apartheid, the system of racial segregation that was prevalent in South Africa. And so Koppel looked at Bishop Tutu and asked if this wasn't a hopeless cause to try to get rid of apartheid in that country. And Tutu looked at him and said, well, of course it's hopeless from a human point of view. And then a smile came on his face. And he said, we believe in the resurrection. And so we are prisoners of hope. We too are prisoners of hope, taken captive by the risen Savior and filled with the knowledge that nothing is impossible with God. We have seen death transformed into life. We have seen the impossible made real. Christ stands before us, calling us to him, and then sends us into the world to proclaim that he is risen. He has risen indeed. And we know this because folks like Mary and Martin Luther and John Wesley and Martin Luther King Jr. and all sorts of other folks weren't willing to stop with a single glance. No, they took a second look, a third and a fourth and a fifth and however many looks it took until they encountered the living and the risen Christ. Friends, some of you today find yourselves in a pit of despair. You feel like hope is gone. You've looked in the tomb and it's empty. You don't know where Jesus has gone and frankly you're not really sure where to go to find him. So take another look. Don't settle for the easy answers, but look into your pain and despair and you will discover the risen Christ standing in your midst offering love and comfort there are others of us for whom things are doing pretty well. You've taken a look at Jesus and maybe even looked at the tomb, but you don't find much there, and so you just head home without really understanding what's going on. Take another look. For there's more to the story than meets the eye. I challenge you to spend some extra time searching for Jesus. You see, he wants to meet you and stand before you and lead you to a whole new way of life. Take another look and experience the risen Christ. Take another look. All of us, no matter where we sit or stand today. Let's cast aside our complacency, our fear, and most of all, our smug notions that we fully know everything we need to know about Jesus. Take another look and be prepared to discover more hope than we can handle. Take another look and encounter anew the one who healed the sick and who fed the hungry and the one that raises all of us to new life. Christ has risen. Christ has risen indeed. Alleluia. Amen. I'm going to invite you to turn in your hymnal to page number 364 as we sing our response about the one who lives.
So this is the time in our service where we do share how God has gifted us this week. And we do have many gifts in the room, several folks that we haven't seen in a while or are new with us, and we want to welcome you to City Road Chapel. And if there's anything we can do to help you in your journey of faith, please let us know. I want to give a special gift that Miss Joy Luthi is here with us, and it's a blessing to have you here, Joy. Uh, and. And I'll make sure folks don't rush you, okay, because I know you're tired, but we're glad to have you here this morning. Um, are there other blessings that we need to lift up this morning? Yes, ma'am. Um, Got, Got to hold your fourth grandson on your knees. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Actually, there, and because he lives, we left out the verse about how sweet it is to hold a newborn baby. So that's uh, exactly. Others? Anyone else? Yes, ma'am. I'm going to have to, you're going to have to tell me again because I'm old and deaf. Excuse me? Because Christ was risen today. Amen. Amen. Anyone else? Let's sing our praises to God. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise the all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Moving to our prayer concerns for today, I do have a couple just to lift up. I continue to pray for Susie Capps, who's one of our Housing Navigation Center guests as she uh, is struggling with cancer. Uh, also prayers for Lisa and her daughter in her daughter's car wreck. Uh, Joy, we have continued to pray, surround you in prayer, and will continue to do so. 
Uh, Samantha said her ribs are doing better, but we'll keep you on the list. And uh, everybody else I think you're familiar with. Are there other prayer concerns that we would lift up this morning? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so Sister Susan has a heart blockage. Please pray for her. Anyone else? We'll see no one. Let's go to God in prayer. Holy and living Christ, we come before you as broken people. We know that we fail you in so many ways. And we need the hope that you give us. And so, holy God, we ask that you send Jesus to us to make us anew. Help us to keep looking even when we don't see you. Help us to hear your love and your grace. Lord, forgive us for how we fall short and transform us. Loving God, we come as your body to lift up the concerns of the world for folks for whom hope seems distant in the midst of pain and struggle and heartbreak. And Lord, we ask that you bring forth healing and help us to be able to hear and listen to one another and to be able to experience that. And God, watch over us. Be with those who are sick. Be with those who are in despair. Help us to, to experience your presence in the midst of it all. And Lord God, we do pray for our world, a world that needs transformation. And we thank you, Jesus, that you have overcome the power of sin and death in the world, that you've come to bring forth a new kingdom and help us to bring that new kingdom into being as you would have us do. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I'm going to invite you to just stay seated, if you would, and let's sing victory the chorus to Victory in Jesus together. prepare to go I'm going to share with you my favorite Easter song you can watch the screens and uh, Darren hit it and you're dismissed after this is over
Jesus Christ is no longer dead. 